Hello, I'm Dennis Heitkamp, and I've been a member of the New Braunfels Lions Club since 1985. I've asked to, been asked today to speak for just a minute about what is a Lions Club, what do Lions mean, and then finish that off with the Texas Lions Camp. And I think that fits together real well. When we talk about what is a Lions Club and what Lions mean, Many of, that, uh, many of those features are exactly the same. And I would like to, to go back to 1917, when a group of, of lions from Chicago and Texas, under the leadership uh, of their leader lions, decided that they were going to form an organization that benefits the community and the world. That, at that time, they, they got together. They were a service organization. I mean, they were not a service organization. They were uh, a social organization. And Melvin Jones, who was probably the leader of that group, decided to convince them that they would find it much more meaningful in life if they provided service for the community. They got together. They met a number of times up in Chicago. And they came up with what I call, or they, it's called the Lions Club's Objectives. And this is what Lions mean. And I want to read those because they were carefully worded by those people in 1917. The first is to create and foster a spirit of understanding amongst peoples of the world. Now that's, that's pretty deep and pretty much of a challenge for all of us. Number two, to promote the principles of good government and good citizenship. Well, we surely can see uh, in our local communities in today's environment that good government and good citizenship is very important. Number three, to take an active interest in the civic, cultural, social, and moral welfare of the community. You can see from that alone that they're not talking about just socializing. They're talking about getting involved in the community. Number four, to unite the clubs in the bonds of friendship, good fellowship, and mutual understanding. And uh, this showed the type of camaraderie that, that Lions uh, were going to try to develop. Number five, to provide a forum for the open discussion of all matters of public interest, provided, however, that partisan politics and secretary Secretary and religion should not be debated at club meetings. Uh, you can see from that that they, they were pretty much going to be open for everyone. Six, to encourage service-minded men and women to serve their community without uh, personal financial reward and to encourage efficiency and promote high ethical standards in commerce, industry, public works, and private endeavors. There again, this, this is what Lions stand for. And this is what the original clubs were chartered under. There were two other things that I need to add to that. The first is they came up with a mission statement They're at their first convention in 1917. And that mission statement is to empower volunteers to serve their communities, meet humanitarian needs, encourage peace, and promote international understanding through Lions Clubs. And along with that, they have their vision statement, which I think was very important. To be the global leader in community and humanitarian service. And I think I think this last one of being a leader, a global leader in humanitarian service can best be expressed by the thing we know as Site First, which came into being in the year 2000. The first thing that they were going to try to do under Site First was to get the funds necessary to combat river blindness around the world. Now. You may not know what river blindness is because we really don't experience river blindness in this country. But in many African countries, in any South American countries, 
many kids lose their sight because of a small in insect that comes out of the water where they are living around them and actually plants eggs in the eyes of these young kids and they lose their sight because of this. We were able to get pharmaceutical companies to develop a pin, pill that the kids could take which would counteract this animal's laying eggs in, in, in their eyes. Later in 2000 and oh, maybe 2010, we came up with another sight first objective, measles. Now you may say, well we don't have many measles in this country, although it, it is again coming back. Maybe because we're not getting enough people vaccinated, maybe, uh, maybe because they don't have the funds, or maybe because we haven't educated them. But in some countries, most blindness is caused by measles. We're again able to, to combine with uh, pharmaceutical companies and got vaccines into the hands of, of doctors in these communities and kids are being um, inoculated against, against measles. Since 2000, these site first projects that I mentioned, we've collected over $325 million and have spent that on the kids around the world. Again, here, uh, we are obviously one of the leaders in our community and global service. I'd like to talk a little bit now about one of our major projects. And I was asked to address this as the Lions Club structure. Uh, service organizations are all chartered under the Internal Revenue Code, uh, U.S. Internal Revenue Code, or the Internal Revenue of all the countries. By the way, there are 200 countries that now have Lions Clubs. It was chartered as a tax-exempt organization. But for your information, I'd like to explain just a little bit because there are different forms of tax-exempt organization. Lions Clubs, as well as other service clubs, are chartered under a section of the Internal Revenue Code, better known as 501c4. When we become a club and we're chartered by international, we automatically get that uh, charter as a 501c4, which is a tax exempt. But what does that mean? Well, there's different tax exempts. Under 501c4, we don't pay income tax. Well, that's pretty nice because any fundraiser we have, we surely don't want to pay income tax on it. We also don't pay sales tax on items that we use for our club, for our club itself. And you say, what that might be? Well, it could be uh, printer ink, uh, cartridges, papers, stamps, whatever we're buying, we don't pay sales tax on those. Later, we found in the year 2000, and we were chartered in 1924, uh, in a few years we'll have our 100th anniversary. But we found that we really needed to get a second organization, and that is a tax exempt under 501c3. Well, three is lesser number than four, it's higher on the, on the podium. Uh, there is a one and two, but that is not really a tax-exempt organization, it's definitions. Three is the highest. What happens with 501c3? You don't pay income tax, that's the same. You don't pay sales tax on items you use, that's the same. But there is another major difference, and the reason we chartered a 501c3 is people that give contributions, that give donations to a 501c4, which the club is chartered under, cannot deduct that from their income tax. The 501c3 
which is a philanthropic organization, you can deduct that money. So if we go out to the public and ask for funds, or we go out to corporate sponsors and ask for funds, they can deduct that uh, 5013C3 donation from their income tax. So all of our funds now that come from the public, and you'll hear more about these, our fundraising activities like Worst Fest and uh, White Cane, all of those come under this philanthropic 501c3. So we don't, <clears throat> people can, can automatically deduct any contributions they made from their, from their income tax at the end of the year. So really when you join the Lions Club, the Noon Club in New Braunfels, you're joining two organizations. You're joining a 501c4, which is a normal service club, and a 501c3, which is a philanthropic uh, club, where you can deduct donations from that from that organization. So you have two two clubs that you actually join when you join the Noon Lions Club. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the service. And then I was asked to talk about the Texas Lions Camp. That's probably the biggest service project that we have uh, in our club in the state of Texas. It's a Texas Lions camp. camp. It was founded in 1949 during the height of the polio epidemic. And some Lions got foresighted. The Lions got together and decided they were going to buy some property in Kerrville that was excess to the VA hospital, which is right there in Kerrville. In fact, it was 500 plus acres. And they bought it, they signed for it, and then went out to the clubs of Texas. Some close to a thousand clubs in Texas contributed and bought that beautiful hill country, 500 acres. They then started building bunkhouses, etc., all by lion's hands at that time. And we were small. And obviously, um, financially strapped with the purchase of this 500 acres. And in 1953, the first polio victims showed up at Kerrville for a camp to show these kids that they can do anything they want to do that kids with normal, dis, uh, normal kids could do. They just may have to do it a little differently. Well now, since that period of time, we have served over 70,000 kids in the Kerrville camp. It cost us about $1,800 for each camper. The camp lasts a week. They come in on, on Sunday and they leave on Friday night or Saturday morning. We have up to 1,500 kids. We have eight bunkhouses. We got a dining hall that will seat and serve 500 kids at one time. Beautiful dining hall. We have an Olympic-sized pool. We have an equestrian center with 22 horses. We have a, a pond a, with <clears throat> paddle boats and talk about fish. There's some really big catfish in there. The kids all get to catch fish. They also get the paddle boat on that lake. It's actually a small lake. We have campsites. We have camp suddenly where the kids go out and camp at night and all of a sudden they have an Indian raid suddenly and some of the counselors come in. Speaking of counselors, we have from six, from 160 to 180 counselors we hire every summer for these kids. We have 22 full-time employees at the camp year-round. The <clears throat> camps start after school let's up because we have we can most of our counselors that we have to hire for that period of time are college kids most of them are majoring in, in academic programs that relates to to handling of kids with special needs and we cannot get the counselors that we need or the quality that we need until until the summer and we cannot get the kids obviously 
the kids are in, in school. Because our kids that come to the camp, and let me first say we have kids with, with special or any kind of disabilities, and I'm talking about kids that are completely blind, kids that are completely deaf, kids that have lost arms. I knew one kid that went through there that had only one right arm and hand. He had no left arm and no, no legs. But again, trying to get this kid to, to, to realize that he can do things that anybody can do, but we're going to have to help him do it a little bit differently. So going on, with I talked about the bunkhouses, we have archery ranges, we have equestrian centers, they all get to ride horses. A swimming pool, this Olympic sized swimming pool, the pool has a, a beach front entry where we can actually take a wheelchair if we have to down into the water for these kids. They come in, as I said, on Sunday and leave the next Saturday. Councils work that whole period taking care of these kids. What type of kids? Kids with special disabilities. We have five camps, five one-week camps with special disability. Any kind of special disability. We have two camps for diabetic. That's type 1 diabetics. Insulin dependent diabetics. We have Two more camps where we actually lease the facilities to special groups. One of the biggest one is the Texas Burn Victims Group, where young kids that have had burns over a significant part of their body are, are sent to camp. And we take care of all of the, the arrangements and everything, which, by the way, is at no cost to the camper or their parents. Lions pay for the full share. We have over two million dollar budget a year. We have camp facilities are now over thirty million dollars. We have a rec center. We have a, a a sports complex. We have a miniature golf course. I could go on and on in the facilities that they have. We have a radio station. We have where kids can actually uh, you know, pretend that their announcers is on the radio. So we have a really fun-packed uh, program for these kids for their one week. Let me give you an example as, <clears throat> as I finish up. When I was a director of the camp, and I have, and I have I've been on the executive committee for eight years, but before that I was an elected director from our district to the camp. I got to go up to the camp and with one little group up to what was called Inspiration Point. We got up to Inspiration Point and, and they had their evening hot dogs and s'mores or whatever. And, and then the kids would pick out a twig and they'd blow their wish on the twig and throw it in the campfire and the smoke would come up. And the story was that the smoke would drift down over the campus. You can see the whole, the whole area right below, because inspiration points here at the high point of the camp, of the facilities. They would not have to tell their wish, just hold their wish to themselves. They also, told me at that time, you're going to have to make your wish too, the kids did. So I made my little, blew my wish on a stick and threw it into the fire. And I didn't tell anyone what my wish was. But some number of years later, I met this little girl named Mary who was in a wheelchair and had been a wheelchair for quite a number of years. She was at the camp. And she was 16 years old, which is, <clears throat> they age out. They can't go anymore. We, that's, that's the oldest uh, children that we take, 16 years of age. She was obviously very handicapped. She was crying. They all do. They all cry when they age out. Can't come back to another camp. And it was our awards night 
Friday night, and her parents were there to pick her up on Saturday morning. As they have to, the kids have to leave by noon on Saturday morning because we're ready for the next group coming in. And her parents came up to me and says, we're going to pick her up about 10 o'clock. Would you do me a favor? And she says, yeah, go ahead. Because I, at that time, I was president of the camp. And what is it? Mary would like to go up to Inspiration Point one more time. I says, I think I can arrange that. Meet me at the cattle gate that goes up to Inspiration Point at 10 o'clock. And I'll open it and we'll go on up there. We got there and they had a van. Mary, on her wheelchair, exited the van. She had her mother, dad, and a brother. Her brother was about nine years old. And she said, I said, well, we're going to drive up to Inspiration Point. And Mary said, no, I want to do it the way we did it when we were campers. We walked up there. And when she meant walk, she meant wheelchair. I had no idea and couldn't imagine how she was going to take that wheelchair up that hill. But she did. Her dad got out and was going to push her. And she said, no. Now, our little nine-year-old brother got behind and gave her a little help. She allowed that. She allowed her nine-year-old brother to help her. She wouldn't let her dad. Dad told mother, drive the vehicle up, because we'll pick her up when she gets to the top. They got all the way at the top, and she went right to the outlook, overlook of the camp, where the retaining wall is, parked her wheelchair right there and locked it. And then she looked down at the camp. She looked over at the sports lake, and she just nodded. And she looked over at the dining facility, and she nodded. She looked over at the bunkhouses, and she nodded. She went through the whole thing, including the high ropes course we have, where she went, crawled the wall with help, and went down the zip line. And she nodded. She went through everything. She went over to the horse barns, looked at the horses, and she nodded. And she then said, turns around to me, says, that was my wish many years ago, that I could do all those things. And <clears throat> so <clears throat> we were getting ready to leave, and we got her in the van, and they were getting ready to drive off, and her dad came up to me and said, we don't know, you know, Mary has for years talked about after high school she was going to go to college, and then she wanted to go to med school. We never thought it was possible. There was just no way she was going to be able to do that. And he gets over and gets in the driver's seat of the van, and the mother comes up to me and hugs me. Says, we never thought Mary would be able to go to medical school. But now I think she can. Because of what y'all did for her, I think she can. She can do anything she wants to do. Her little brother comes over and says, Mary is awesome. Her nine-year-old brother. And they drove off. Now, I, I can't tell you that I was able to follow her or whether she ever went through med school or not, but I know we got her a start. And I had I had some of the counselors come up with a uh, with a uh, golf cart to pick me up, so I wouldn't have to walk back down. And when they were picking me up, I was thinking over there, you know, here I was president of the camp years ago. I blew my wish on that stick and threw it in the fire. And my wish was that someday I could be president of that camp. And the hero was helping these kids. That's what Texas Lions Camp says to us. There's a saying that you become a lion when you sign that dotted line on, on your application. You become a club member lion. But you don't become a true lion until you've been to the Texas Lions Camp. I became a true lion that day. Thank you very much.